talk a lot more about the economy right now and potentially hurdles ahead in yesterday's latest release of minutes from the Federal Reserve. Uh, officials expressed some alarm about the possible economic impact of the coronavirus. And Steve Leisman joins us right now with a very special guest on this and so much more. Steve. Andrew, thank you very much. Good morning from the Federal Reserve Building. We're here with Federal, Vice, Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Richard Clarida. Uh, Chairman, Vice Chairman Clarida, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. I really want to just, I wasn't planning to start. I want to jump off this Philly Fed number. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'll say what you said during the break. You go, that's a beat. Yeah. We're waiting. For the estimate was 8, 36, 7. Rick says it's a 20-year high. What do you make of that? Well, look, I think that the fundamentals of the U.S. economy uh, were solid in 2019 and continuing into 2020. Obviously, that's one number. I haven't seen it uh, in advance. But absolutely, the fundamentals in the U.S. are strong, sustained growth, strongest labor market in, in 50 years, uh, price stability with inflation close to our, our goal. So, yeah, it's a good picture. And when you see a jobless claims number, which seems to be permanently below this I don't know, if I said 220, I know I'd be accurate, but I could also be accurate if I went skinnier at 210. Yeah. What does that tell you about the job market and where, where well, uh, you know, payroll goes? Historically, job, you know, jobless claims are an important indicator of the right. state of the labor market, and it reaffirms what, what I just said. The labor market is very strong and robust, and that's a huge positive for the uh, economy. And, of course, as you know and your viewers know, Steve, we have a dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability. So it's, it's good news that we're operating here. I do want to pick up on the Philly Fed number, which obviously you didn't see the details. Yeah. I didn't see them. Yeah. One of the things in the minutes yesterday did say that their trade tensions had come down. And Rick talked about this idea that yeah. is it possible we could be seeing the early stages of a turnaround in business investment after the decline of the uncertainty uh, from the trade deal. Well, there are December. two pieces to that, Steve, so let me address both. I think there's, there's no doubt there's been a decline in trade policy uncertainty. We have U.S. MPA, MCA, we have uh, phase one of U.S. China, and obviously Brexit ha has occurred, and, and we've seen that. Uh, and so there's less trade policy uncertainty, and to the extent that was a factor holding back investment, that should be a positive uh, this year. Obviously, uh, financial conditions are certainly accommodative, policies accommodative. So I think coming into the year, certainly I was open to the view that we could see a rebound in business investment. Uh, and of course, the housing sector has been strong and will continue to support growth. Let me turn to another issue that came up in the minutes yesterday, which was the coronavirus. And I want to ask you about your sort of daily routine. Do you watch data for, about the coronavirus every day now? And what are you watching? Well, well, Steve, obviously we have, we have a very capable staff here who, who is doing that, sure. and I'm getting either verbal or, or email briefings uh, on that. Um, and on, a obviously, on a daily basis? Well, certainly I'm getting daily emails yeah, on it, okay. yes. Right. Um, and what I would say about that is obviously, let's begin with, it's a human tragedy for all those afflicted with the coronavirus uh, in China. It's obviously something that is, is probably going to have a noticeable impact on Chinese growth, at least uh, in the first quarter of this year. And we won't know that really till April when we get their GDP uh, statistics. But what Chair Powell and, and, and we have said is vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., what we would be looking for is some body of evidence that suggests that we need to make a material reassessment of our outlook. Right. And, and certainly we have not done that yet. But we're, we are monitoring it because China is a huge part of the global economy. I'm interested, though, in, in how you think about this. Yeah. How what's happening in China that with, with, with the shutdown of factories, uh, the uh, a cutoff of, of tourism, those things, yeah. how do you expect that will affect the U.S.? Where will you be looking for how it will affect the United States Well, economy? I think there are several diff different pieces, uh, Steve. First of all, there is exports to China, and obviously part of the commitments in the Phase 1 deal was for U.S. exports to China to ramp up. So obviously we'll be looking at that. Supply chains are very important. So to the extent that supply chains are disrupted by the coronavirus, that could show up in terms of inputs to the U.S. economy. Um, and obviously you have the effect overall on global economic activity. So we're really looking at multiple uh, indicators right now. But I think the fair point is sitting here in February, it is too soon to tell, but we're monitoring closely. Is it something that, how do you make a distinction between something that you write off? In other words, it's just a one quarter or a two yeah. quarter phenomenon and something that's more inherent or important yeah. to developments of the U.S. economy. Well, again, that's a judgment call and, and, uh, and we're going to be looking at a broad range of data uh, on that. And I think the fair thing is it is just too soon to tell. We are tuned uh, to it uh, and it's obviously something that we should be and we are monitoring closely. Let me turn to um, what's been going on 
with the market right now. And yeah. I know you were at PIMCO for a dozen years, yeah. and so you have a keen uh, a sense of what's going on there. Right now, they're pricing in a rate cut in July, of yeah. uh, 60% probability, something along those lines. Um, how do you react to that? Well, Steve, first of all, um, and you and I have discussed over the years, you know, market pricing on, on rate cuts is a little tricky because there's the market expectation for rates. There can also be term and liquidity premium. So what I prefer to do is to also look at surveys that many folks do of market participants about what they think we're going to do. So I just checked my screen this morning on, on Bloomberg, and they survey about 70 uh, Wall Street economists and asking them where they think the federal funds rate is going to be at year end. And of the 70 they for, that they reach out to, 50 do not think there's going to be a rate cut. So there's obviously a probability of outcomes. But I don't think when you ask folks, they're, they're pricing in that rate cut now, even though market pricing might suggest that. Um, when you look at the level of the stock market, there were a lot of uh, comments in the minutes yesterday about asset valuations yeah. being high. Do you worry about the, the level of the stock market here? Well, let me talk more broadly about financial conditions, Steve. And what we do here at the Fed is we really look at four aspects. We do look at valuation. We also look at leverage. We look at capital in the financial system and liquidity. And if you look at all four of those metrics together, I would judge that right now financial stability risk to the U.S. are moderate. Um, uh, obviously, we can point to different measures of equity valuation. Those tend to be very sensitive about what you use in terms of the level of interest rates. And so we have a world where equity valuations uh, are what they are, but we're also in a world of structurally low equilibrium interest rates. We've got negative rates in Europe. So you have to factor that into the equation. For example, corporate borrowing costs are low, but so are the underlying riskless rates. Corporate spreads are, are certainly not uh, unusual right now. So I think the overall picture, Steve, is that financial stability risks are moderate, but we are closely monitoring the financial system as we should. Do you worry that what the Fed has done in terms of inserting a lot of liquidity yeah. into the market through the purchases of, of treasuries and the repo operations you've done have created the recent boom in the stock market? Let's talk a little bit about these operations. We've had them in place really since September to deal with a very specific issue, which was the disruption in the repo market. As you know, the market for securitized lending against uh, treasuries. Uh, we have been providing liquidity both through repo operations and expanding uh, our balance sheet. The intent of these programs is really just to get liquidity levels in the repo market to levels consistent with our ample reserves goal. We've announced that we're going to be uh, planning to uh, scale back those T-bill purchases in June, and, and the reliance on repurchase operations as well will uh, recede. So certainly review this as really a technical uh, adjustment to a technical it's, problem. It's about the, the connection yeah. between the yeah. stock market and well, the repo operation. I guess I will leave that for others to judge, but certainly the intent of the program is, is really focused on that repo issue right now. And, and, we think, and we think that the program that we put in place in October has been successful, and we are uh, planning to, to wind that down, as we indicated at our January meeting. Vice Chairman Carter, thank you for joining us. Well, this thank morning. you, Steve. Okay, great.